Maranatha, everyone. My name is Pastor Jed, and this is another edition of my weekly video blog, Apologetics in Prophecy, where we take a look at things that have to deal with prophecy and look at them through a biblical apologetical lens. Today, I want to get off subject of our prophecy updates to talk about something that is heavy on my heart, and I, I see a lot of division in the church over, and that is the question is, can God use ungodly men to do his will? That's the question. You know, the reason why I bring it up, because it seems like that um, there's a lot of Christians, and I being one of them, that are supporting our current administration that's in office for the policies that they're putting forward. And Unfortunately, it seems like a lot of people that are in the church don't want to talk about it, are divided about it, and really um, it's caused a lot of strain, I think, to Christians um, on what they should do. Can we support an ungodly leader? Can we support somebody that is not a Christian, that is doing things that we wouldn't think appropriate, but can God use somebody like that to fulfill his will? Back in 2016, I remember that all the churches for up to that point, and still are in a lot of ways, are crossing denominational lines, linking hands with the Catholic Church, and praying for the unborn, praying against the ungodly partial birth abortion that had become the law of the land by the time the 2016 election came around. We were a just appalled by the rising immorality and the subjecting of our children to perverts using the same bathroom as they are. These things that we weren't talking about eight years before that are now center stage in our culture and our life. And as Christians that could not believe that these things were happening to us in our communities and our culture and our country, we're praying to God to do something. I was part of the group that that, that um, prayed in our state as 50 different state capitals across the country during the 2016 summer. All gathered Christians from every state gathered around the state capitol to pray for the upcoming election, pray for our country, and pray for these things that I just talked about. And when God answered our prayer and put somebody in office that we wouldn't expect, Half of the people that have been praying with us for these things threw their hands up in the air and go, how can we support somebody like that? So the question is, can God use somebody ungodly to fulfill his word? Well, let's go to fulfill his word and his will. Well, let's look into scripture and see if God does do something like that. And actually something like I just described actually happened in the Bible. And that what takes us to the book of Habakkuk. Habakkuk was a prophet before the, the fall of Judah. And he was a righteous man. He was a fundamental Bible-believing Christian, you would say, in that time. But they weren't Christians, but he was a prophet. He was God's man. He spoke for God. He was the guy that was that was there to represent God and speak God's word to the people. And he's looking around at his country and he's seeing the rise of immorality. He's seeing children being burned to the God of Molech. That was their type of abortion back in those days. He was seeing the injustice and the things that were happening in the country and to the nation of Israel. And he didn't know what to do. He was God's man. He's, so he comes to God and we see in verse 2 of the book of Habakkuk, chapter 1, O Lord, how long shall I cry? And you will not hear. Even cry out to you violence, and you will not save. The kids were being burned, wholesale slaughter on the, on the altars to Molech. Why do you show me iniquity and cause me to see trouble? All the things that were happening in the world around him. For plundering and violence are before me. There is strife and contention arises. Therefore the law is powerless. And justice never goes forth. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore per perverse judgment proceeds. He was like, that was it. Up in arms. Just like we are. We saw 
the, the, the desecration of marriage between one man and a woman. We see the rise of immorality to the point now where we have to say that it is okay for a man to dress like a woman and we need to celebrate it. That is disgusting things that even before I was a Christian thought were wrong. So we start to see those things. We pray against them and God does something and now we reject what God is doing. And because that's what Habakkuk did, because the Lord would answer Habakkuk and he said, look among the nations and watch, be utterly astounded for I will work a work in your days, which you will not believe though it were told you for indeed, I am raising up the Chaldeans, a bitter and hasty nation who marches through the breadth of the earth to possess dwelling places that are not theirs. They are terrible and dreadful. Their judgment and their dignity proceed from themselves. Their horses also are swifter than leopards and more fierce than evening wolves. Their chargers charge ahead. Their cavalry comes from afar. They fly as the eagle that hastens to eat. See, they, he's talking about Nebuchadnezzar. He's talking about the army that he would bring. And of course, the prophet was like, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. Wait a minute. You can, you're not going to use the wicked to judge the righteous. Why would you do that? They deserve judgment more than we do. We're your people. And of course, the, the back and forth goes on and on, but we have the full word. We know what happened because we know that Jeremiah would tell them be, right before the captivity, right before this would happen, Jeremiah is warning the nation, telling them what was going to happen as it was happening. So it was like he would tell them and it would happen and they wouldn't listen. And that was what was happening. And he said, um, God was telling, he, he's, he was, you know, um, when Ze during Zedekiah's reign, um, Jeremiah went and told Zedekiah, I have made the earth and the, the man and the beast that are on the ground by my great power and by my outstretched arm and have given it to whom it seemed proper to me. And now I have given all these lands into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, my servant and the beasts of the field. I have also given him to serve him. All, so all nations shall serve him and his son and his son's son until the time of his land comes and many then many nations and great kings shall make the, him serve them. So right away we see that God is calling Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, his servant. This is God's guy. This is God's man that he is going to use. And it shall be that the nation and kingdom which does not serve Nebuchadnezzar, the king of Babylon, and which will not put its neck under the yoke of the king of Babylon, the ones that hashtag not my king, I will punish, says the Lord, with the sword, the famine, and the pestilence until I have consumed them by his, by his hand. Therefore, do not listen to your prophets, your diviners, your dreamers, your soothsayers, or your sorcerers who speak to you, saying you shall not serve the king of Babylon. So that's pretty harsh, but that was exactly what happened. God called Nebuchadnezzar to do something for his people because his people had strayed from him. So God is using an ungodly king to fulfill his word. So what happens? We know a lot about um, Babylon. We know that when Nebuchadnezzar came into Babylon, he was very cruel. This guy was a brutal king. He was involved in such death and destruction and the things that he did for a, if we saw somebody that was part of our country today that would be unredeemable sins that we would see them to do we would think they were they were too far out and can you imagine being the recipients of what was happening with the king of babylon because it says here that that um when during one of the the um the fur the right after the destruction of Babylon, when Nebuchadnezzar went back and Nebuchadnezzar, captain of the guard, took captives and brought them to the king of Babylon at Riblah. Then the king of Babylon struck them and put them to death at Riblah and in the land of Hamath. Thus Judah was carried away captive from his own land. Can you imagine that? You're now captive. 
And we know the story of Daniel, the three young boys that are in Daniel with, with Daniel. They were they were in they were selected and put into the school and they wouldn't eat the king's meat or his delicacies, but God blessed them because they were staying true to God. But God raised them up under the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, who most likely killed their parents right before their eyes. How could you support a leader like that? How could you sit on, I mean, they had a choice. They could have just told, I'm not going to serve Nebuchadnezzar. That's against my religion. I can't do this. But God had a plan for Daniel, and we know, and we're thankful that God fulfilled that plan, that he became an administrator of this ungodly, unruly, awful king that probably killed his parents, killed all his countrymen, and put them into slavery, into captivity. But yet we see a different side of Daniel that we would not expect. Somebody who gets it, that understood that Nebuchadnezzar was God's man after reading the book of Jeremiah after seeing the prophecies being fulfilled, he understood that, that, that Nebuchadnezzar, and I am grateful that Daniel gives us an example because he says that here in um, Daniel, we see when Daniel uh, was in as an administrator to Nebuchadnezzar, we know that at one point, Nebuchadnezzar had a dream, right? And it's really what's neat about chapter four of is, is, is Nebuchadnezzar writes a chapter of the Bible, Daniel chapter four. And I am confident after reading this chapter, this is a testimony of Nebuchadnezzar that he will be in heaven when we get there. How could somebody like Nebuchadnezzar get saved? Somebody who did what he did, but God had a plan for him. And we need to understand that God has a plan for people that are ungodly when he chooses to use them. It's God is sovereign. He's the one who raises kings up, and he's the one who brings them down. He's put every president in place that we have in this nation up to now. And we need to understand that, that, that Daniel, and like us, shouldn't give up on our leaders. Because when, Daniel had, when Nebuchadnezzar had this dream, and we know the dream was about him going crazy for three and a half years, and Daniel's response to the king was, was my Lord, may the dream concern those who hate you and its interpretation concern your enemies. Daniel loved Nebuchadnezzar. How could he love a person like that? How could he serve on his administration? How could he do these things? You know, because he understood God has a plan that's beyond us. We don't understand what God does. But when we pray and God answers our prayers, through an ungodly, unruly, unlikable person, we need to praise God and thank him for it because abortions are down right now, because the freedom for kids to be able to pray before sports events across this nation has been reestablished under this leadership. There has been freedom given to Christians to be able to worship the way they want to. The, the, they've been we now have a louder voice against the immorality that is rising up in our country than we had three or four years ago. So we should celebrate those things. Now we don't celebrate the person. We don't worship the person. We worship God. But if God we pray and God does something, we need to realize what God is doing. We may not like it. We may not understand it, but we need to pray for our leaders. We need to pray for our leaders. And I'm going to look for one last thing that the the instruction that we have concerning that. And in 1 Timothy chapter 2, we are given the exhortation. It is an exhortation, and that's to you and I. When we start to struggle with our emotions and the way we feel about certain people that are put in power, but we have to remember God's the one who sets those up in power. We are not, they're, they're God's workmen that God has put in place for a purpose. We don't, we don't like the character of people. We don't have to like people, but do, can God use ungodly people, ungodly men to fulfill his will? And we just read, yes, he can. And the Bible tells us, and Timothy, Paul tells us, therefore I exhort, first of all, that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and the giving of thanks be made for some men, no, all men. For kings and all who are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and reverence. Godliness is important to God. 
Righteousness is important to God. Righteousness exalts a nation, but sin is a reproach to any people. So can God use ungodly people to have his righteousness on a land, in leadership, in places? Should we surround people that are doing the right thing, even if they're not believers? Well, I'm going to end today with this, and I know there's a few of you that disagree with me. You, you're still fighting with your flesh and your emotions, trying to figure out how can I get behind a candidate or, or a leader of this nation that, is, that says these things, that tweets these things, that does these things. That's really up between you and God and you and your conscience. And, and, and I don't dislike you because you might disagree with me, but I know the pattern of things that have happened. And I know from the Bible the way God works with leaders and countries and how he's worked to bring awakenings and, and renewals to places. I know that how he answers prayer. And I remember distinctly how much prayer that my wife and I and other Christian leaders had in 2016 about the ungodly partial birth abortion, about the rise of, uh, of, of, of gay marriage and where it was leading our country into the transgender rights, which exposes our kids to perverted people in the bathrooms. I couldn't, couldn't take it anymore. I was praying for God to do something, and he did something. Now, he didn't do it the way I wanted it, but he did it. And I have to be grateful and thankful. So before we leave today, I want to ask you, can God use ungodly people to fulfill his will? And the answer is, he does it every day. He does it with me. If, if, if before I was a Christian... All the things that we dislike about this person, I did. If, if there was cell phone tape of some of the conversations I had in the back of buses, and if Twitter was around back then and I was speaking my mind and you could bring those up, man, I'd look like a pretty bad dude. People would say, you're disqualified to serve because of the life that you lived and these things that you said. And that's untrue because God saves sinners. I am a sinner but I am redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. I am an ungodly person that has been forgiven by God. And I struggle with my flesh every day. People on the internet that are unbelievers will say things that my mind wants to say, my flesh wants to say, but I know better because I have the Holy Spirit that says, don't say that, Jed. That's an ungodly thought. You need to crucify that. And so the question is, if God... How can God use ungodly people to fulfill his will? He does it every day with you and I. Because we are called to be the voice of righteousness in the world. We are to be the one crying in the wilderness right now during this time and age saying that there is, and I, I talked about this last week, that we are to be the voice of righteousness in this, this dark age. We are to be lights of the world. And really it is because of us that and and that's why when you look at somebody like we see in in leadership today and 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 there's people that are good christian believers surrounding him that's a good thing you should be supportive of that and you need to pray for your leaders like paul said because we need to be praying for them that god would open their eyes cuz is there still hope for the president of the united states only in jesus christ is there st still hope for the, the president of Russia, only in Jesus Christ. Every world leader that's there can find hope and salvation in Jesus Christ. And it's our job to pray for them, that God would open their hearts and they would be able to receive Jesus Christ. And then we can see transformation. But like I said, this is going on a little long, but it's something that's been in my heart and I had to share it because God has used ungodly people to fulfill his will. And that there were those that were God's people that supported and joined forces with that person and didn't give up on them because they understood that that was God's man. And we know that the Bible tells us that kings and rulers are set up by Jesus and that God is in control. He is sovereign over the nations and they are being set in place to fulfill his will. And we've been given a window of opportunity right now. 
a freedom to be able to share the gospel. And if you're watching this today, just for the for the concept or the thing, or maybe you've been watching my program and you don't know Jesus, this is the gospel. The gospel is that Jesus Christ was God born in born in the flesh. He was God who took on flesh. And he lived, and while he was here on this earth, he lived a sinless, perfect life. And he did miracles to attest who he was. And that that he only came for one purpose, though. As a sinless God-man, he was able to go to a cross and die for your sins. And how do we know that he died for our sins? Because a lot of people have died for people. God rose him again from the dead. Three days later, he rose from the dead. And so we know that God accepted that sacrifice on our behalf then. So with that said, this is a long video. If that's you today and you want to make a profession, all you have to do is get on your knees, ask God to forgive you for your sins, and he will forgive you for your sins. Then pick up a Bible, start reading the New Testament. Matthew through, through all the way through a bunch of times till you get to really know Jesus. And find a church that teaches the Bible. And if you need any help, if you want to yell at me for my support of the current administration, you can. That's fine. I'm not shy. Um, we can have discussions as long as they're civil. And so I love you all. And again, I say Maranatha because we, we hope the Lord comes before the next election. I say vote for Jesus coming back. Amen? Amen. Love you all. Let's talk to you later. Bye.